Okay, hey, let's uh, make a start. Welcome to the August um, Node Monthly Meeting. So we'll follow basically the same pattern as we typically do. Um, reminder, this is this is interactive. This is not just nurse presenting to users. This is a, a discussion. So yeah, please participate. Um, so we've got a couple of dozen people. I think that's enough. That, that that's a yeah, a suitable size that yeah. Feel free to just uh, unmute and and speak up. Um, if it starts getting too noisy, then we'll get the hands up or whatever. But but yeah, by all means, uh, join the chat. And uh, I see Will has a hand up already. So I'd like to uh, look for beta testers for HPC Toolkit on Perlmutter. Uh, I've built it last week and it works uh, with PC sampling as well, but without Pappy. So I'm still uh, looking for beta testers to see whether it works for all applications or not, uh, things like that. So uh, shoot me up a okay. uh, chat on the Slack if you are interested, so I can tell you where the module is. Cool, uh, do do that, but we'll come back around to that. Uh, a few points down in the agenda when we'll actually have uh, a series of uh, announcements and, and CFPs, uh, including this sort of thing where, um, yeah, there's not just announcements from NERSC, it's uh, announcements yeah, across across NAB. Um, so we'll go through a kind of normal order. Uh, win of the month today, I learned a series uh, of announcements and our topic of the day is uh, OCAP. You will have seen that the OCAP process for AY 2023 is now open. There's a few changes this year because of yeah, moving to Perlmutter and Clayton will walk us through the details and yeah, help with the Q&A. Um, so to start out with, win of the month. So the, yeah, the idea here is to uh, show off an achievement or shout out somebody else's achievement that you are aware of. Um, and you know, it can be big or small from solved a bug that was, yeah, giving you trouble for a while through to having a, a paper accepted and yeah some of these um actually one of our announcements coming up is going to be to do with um scientific achievement and yeah, hpc awards and, yeah some of these things might be candidates for that uh, anybody like to kick us off with an interesting success in the last few weeks oh yeah that was a success that i announced ah yep so you've got um, HPC to took it up and running. I guess is the is the core of it. Yes, sounds good. It's been a couple of years since I poked around with HPC toolkit, but I, uh, if I remember rightly, it, it has sort of a bunch of different um, modes of performance measurement, right? That's correct. And with PC sampling, you can get into the kernel and uh, correlate like blind information from inside the GPU kernel to say uh, you have data from stalls uh, or things like that uh, inside the hardware uh, registers. I'm surprised as well it works because uh, Perlmutter hasn't been patched with the, uh, what was it called again? The vulnerability uh, with hardware counters uh, issue that was announced a couple months back. Oh, uh, so I think that's back now. I think the, the patch that allowed us to go back to you know, collecting hardware counters is, is in there and, and the hardware counters are available again. I think it was applied for Cori, but not Perlmutter. Uh, we should check that. Unless it was applied during the last <laughs> maintenance yesterday. Uh, it's worth checking. Uh, my understanding was that it had been applied a, a couple of maintenances back, but, but yeah, we, we can check that. Um, something you will probably find is, um, so on Core and Perlmutter, we, we use a system called LDMS, which stands for the Lightweight Data Metric System, um, to, to collect data about you know how kind of how the nodes are running and you know one of the, the sort of the aims with that is to be able to pull out performance information 
the catch is, of course, that means that it's doing um, uh, counter sampling as well. So if you're using tools, uh, probably probably including HPC Toolkit, um, there's a option in either in Sbatch where uh, we, we we have some notes on it in our in our documents. We need to do a bit of search for it. Um, but you, you essentially need to, to switch off the, the ongoing um, counter collection just for your job so that you can yes, collect them it's directly. Yes, TCGMI. I remember that after uh, I got that after somebody at the ticket uh, told me about it. I'll paste the yep. link in documentation. Mm, that, yep, that, that will be useful. Thank you. So yeah, nice, nice work getting that up and going. I think that will, that will be quite a useful tool. Uh, particularly as people will be uh, getting things ready for Perlmutter for, yeah, during the last half of this year. Um, uh, sorry, could you uh, just to uh, follow up? Uh, I don't, I'm not too familiar with HPC Toolkit. I just found from the Google, but not quite sure if this is the correct one. Can you put the link uh, to the uh, HPC Toolkit that was just talked about? I'm kind of curious if we could use that on Parmata to uh, check how what's the bottleneck of my code I'm using. Oh, there's one. Sure, sure. The main website okay. is hpctoolkit.org. I can so, paste that in the uh, uh, yeah. chat. Got it. Thanks, Will. And you were saying, Will, that you're looking for uh, testers for it. So that, that could be a good opportunity. Yeah, sounds like it. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear how that uh, uh, works out with, um, yeah, I guess uh, how how easily you're able to use it and and what you learn in uh, sort of yeah, identifying bottlenecks. Anybody else have something they'd like to shout out as a, a win of the month, either either for themselves or something they've uh, seen, you know, one of their colleagues did. Uh, this is not, I, I mean, both Wind of the Mountain and also the questions about NASC documentation. Uh, this is Koichi yep. from PNML. Uh, so we, you know, some part of the Nugex uh, launching a new user group, special interest group by the users who's running this Atomse model called WARF on NASC systems, because we are hearing some lack of documentations and then um, you know, exchanging opportunity to exchange information. So we just had a second virtual meeting among members and I am working on adding uh, documentation to NASC on how to really compile and run WARF and then some best practices unique to WOLF to be shared. So that's actually my window of balance. No, finally, I'm, I've been you know, procrastinating how to edit document, ask documentation, and finally I forced myself to run and do that. The one question is that uh, at first I thought it's good to put this new web page under applications, but looks like this page applications are uh, those available already from NASC as module. So not really applicable to the Wolf model we are using because we, it's, it's freely available code you have to download and then compile, not really available the module. So I'm looking for really where it is a good place to put that kind of information. And in this user group style, I think we will find it's quite probably uh, informative and useful for other users who does have faced similar you know, difficulties, you know, that does particular publicly available code is being used for the research, but it's maybe frequently updated or NASC systems also being updated and many users, particularly graduate students having sometimes difficulties to compile and run. So um, maybe sometime we, once we, get this going, maybe we can share our activities so that, you know, other NASC users can form those groups. But I mean, going back to that question, if you have any suggestions to what sections would be appropriate to put this new documentation, I'm really open to any advice. 
Right, right. So, so first up, congratulations and thank you for uh, contributing to our documentation. Um, there's, yeah, I think sure. there's a, a lot of um, benefit in you know, getting input from from users who are using the system for, yeah, you know, as, as you discover things things that work and and things that aren't that trivial. In terms of that application mm. section, the intent of that section, like my view yeah. of the intent of that section, is it's to help users to use applications on nurse systems. So the, mm -hmm. the fact that most of what's there is things that we've got available as modules really reflects the fact that you know those are the ones we've paid attention to oh, okay. <laughs> and put documentation up. So so I think that's a great place to put it. Okay. Uh, that said, you know, if in doubt, you can put in a merge request that would put it there. Mm -hmm. And and part of a merge request includes discussion with sort of you know, other people who are reviewing the merge request and will eventually mm -hmm. merge it. And and so it's also a good place to actually ask a question like, is this the right place for it? Uh, and and there might be some discussion about, oh, maybe it would fit better here, or you know, maybe more people would see it here, or um and and kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, or what you call it, you need the um, merge request into into something that you know, fits nicely and um, right. yeah 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 right right yeah sounds sounds good thanks thank you I'll do that sounding good um, let's move on to we could we can still talk about wins. But the, the, let's also talk about the, the flip side of that coin, which is um, today I learned uh, sometimes when you don't have a win, uh, there's actually a lot of benefit in it because yeah, you discover what doesn't work and um, yeah, and in the process sort of learn more about how you know, how things work at a, at a deeper level, which yeah, leads to wins down the track. So the the point of the of this section is to discuss you know, what what surprised you that might benefit others? And this can be you know, something that didn't work when you tried it, or uh, you know, a, a great talk that you stumbled across, um, you know, a, a resource that would be uh, you know, valuable for us to know about. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pipe in. Um, I run a, a code called ASCOT, which uh, simulates the orbits of charged particles and fusion grade plasmas. It's written by a group in Finland. It was written to be, opti it was sort of optimized for a, a KNL-like architecture. And like many users, I've been uh, working to try to port or, or to build a version of this on, on Perlmutter. And I was surprised that it ran more slowly on Perlmutter than on KNL by about 20 to 30%. And I did a fair okay. amount of documentation. Uh, we, we have had conversations with uh, both uh, support expert, experts at NERSC and the developer. And the developer claims that he has built uh, ASCOT on an AMD-like, or an AMD chip, but uh, an earlier version that's not Milan. And yep. he claims to get a factor of two increase in performance, which is, that, that surprised me an Intel compiler on AMD. So, yep. so of course, it's, it's a statement. I would also like to know whether any anybody else has observed you know, not getting a big improvement going from Cori to Perlmutter on, on CPU-bound tasks. I just yeah. found about twice faster performance on Perlmutter about some Atomos model I'm using just from KNL to Perlmutter. The CPU only calls, it's yeah, almost twice faster on Parameter. And I didn't do anything, pretty much just compile the same way and run. Hey, Steve, this is uh, Richard at Nurse. That's interesting. I don't know, other Steve, Lee, if you've heard of reports like this. I, I do know that, um, I mean, it sounds like there's something just wrong in a configuration or something. Um, I know we did, add, we did look at a number of, um, CPU applications and codes that we had and tried them out on um, on Milan on the on the node and um, the average I think of the things that we looked at uh, which were a dozen or so apps was about three and a half times faster 
or something, three, three to four times faster. So it's a bit surprising it'd be slower. Is this is this on a node by node comparison? Yes, it's a per node comparison. Yeah, I mean that's that's really strange because the, the clock's faster, the, there's more memory, better. I don't know about the memory bandwidth, Steve. You could comment on that, but you know the processors are just more capable. That's that's the reason I was really surprised. I was yeah. expecting a factor of three to four improvement, and. Um, so yeah, we can, we can have people look at it. It sounds like you're already talking mm -hmm. to somebody. Yeah. yeah. So something that uh, I have seen a couple of times, and um, I know like uh, HPE engineers are working on improving, is um, there, there are there are some circumstances where with I think it's where essentially the the communication between processes. With a lot of processes per node can in some circumstances um, uh, basically be a bit slower and there's there's some kind of knobs that we're still working to tweak on that so i, I wonder if that's a factor are you running at a fairly high um mpi count i honestly don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm really a babe in the woods, and this is not the place to you know diagnose my my issues. But I would say that this the problem is sort of trivial, trivially parallelizable because the, the particles don't interact. So each each uh, so is core is given one each core or each thread is given one particle, and off it goes. Um, so I doubt that we're communication bound. Yeah, that is definitely surprising and interesting, and and we should uh, talk more about it. It, sound, it sounds like you're already in conversation with um, with the Shazam, some some nurse support people. So yes, yes, cool. yeah. So we've got some some tracks we can go down to to help with that. And I wonder if Will's announcement about HPC toolkit could be a, an interesting thing to to mm -hmm. throw at it too. It might help to diagnose where the yeah, where the bottleneck is happening, what what sort of component or or a yeah, aspect is slowing it down. Thank you. So yeah, that might might be worth uh, digging into too. Yeah, that's a, a, a what do you call it? A valuable observation and 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 challenge to work on. Hopefully we'll hear in the next uh, in the next meeting that you worked out what was going on. <laughs> uh, come, come sort of closer to a solution. Anybody else got a, a something surprising or challenging to discuss? If not, we might uh, move on to next section. We actually have a bit of a raft of announcements and CFPs, uh, if, I, if I recall correctly for uh, today. Uh, a bunch of them are in the weekly email. Uh, of course, the, yeah, the big one being that the ERCAP allocations um, uh, season is upon us. And you'll have a, you know, a much deeper dive into that fairly shortly. Um, you. We'll have uh, seen announcements and possibly noticed some effects of um, uh, CFS and P scratch upgrades. So the CFS upgrade um, update should now be minimally disruptive. I think the engineers are still working on things, but the part that kind of you know directly impacts the um, yeah, ability to use it is complete, as I understand it. Um, coming up in around about a week is. Uh, a fairly major update to Perlmutter's scratch file system, and so you know, it will be out for in the you know in the order of ten days. So that's uh, one to be uh, very well aware of. And actually, there's probably a good reminder if you're not using them already. Uh, look up file system licenses in our docs. You can uh, use a sbatch dash capital L option to basically tell Slurm what file systems you need. And so if you queue a job. And you know something's going wrong with a file system, or we need to take a file system down for maintenance, such as P scratch. Uh, yeah, we can tell Slurm this file system's not available, and it won't start the job until it is available. 
another big one that you probably saw is that Corey's retirement is now um, in planning. Uh, so it's intended to be what? Well, yeah, the plan is for Corey to retire at the end of this allocation year, which is which, which will be sort of about early or mid January, I think January 17, if I remember rightly. Um, so after that, uh, all so all of next year's allocations will be on Perlmutter, which is uh, all the more reason to yeah get codes ready for Perlmutter. Uh, on Perlmutter, over the last sort of several weeks, you probably you know, noticed announcements about um, we're updating the Perlmutter's GPU nodes to use Slingshot 11, which is the, you know, the I guess the newer version of its interconnect. Um, you know, it involved a hardware update of the nodes as well, which is why the nodes were being sort of taken out and you know, updated and put back in. So that is now complete and all of Perlmutter is Slingshot 11. So yeah, simply to use and yeah, should uh, see some benefits. Other big one, I don't think this was in the weekly email, but you hopefully saw it the other day in a direct email. Um, Perlmutter charging will begin. So, so that is, yeah, charging for Perlmutter jobs will begin after that P scratch update is completed. So uh, yeah, beginning of September. Uh, I think there's there's more detail about that in the email. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll sort of you know, help with you know, controlling the queue. There's, there's quite a lot of uh, demand at the moment and you know, the queues are getting a little bit long. Uh, yeah, so we encourage you to you know, look at what jobs you're submitting and uh, I, I guess prioritize with the, the, the knowledge that charging will start soon. Nominations are now open for the NERSC uh, Early Career HPC Achievement Awards. So yeah, there's a, the ones that the, the winner of the month can be a, um, you know, a candidate for you know, and other things. So we've got a couple of um, categories of these awards. Uh, one is for high impact scientific achievement. So you know, something that what well, yeah, is high impact is, is important to the world. Um, and the other is for innovative use of high performance computing. So if you're you know, exploring new new ways to use or new new things to do with HPC, yeah, we're, we're very interested and there's uh, yeah, awards available for these. And I think Richard can correct me on this. Uh, I think there's two sort of categories, one for early career and one sort of a open category. Is that, is that true? Um, they're all open career. They're all early career now. They're all early career now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So more details on that in the weekly email. Uh, I see there's a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, do we need to provide scaling test data on Palmata for justifying our proposed allocation? So I think I'll defer that question to um, the the topic of the day. Well, uh, Clayton is talking, so we'll come back to that. On um, file system licenses, we're using a Cori. Uh, Perlmutter Scratch might not be available for selection or not documented. Uh, I will need to get back to you on that. Uh, yeah, check that and uh, update the documentation. It's possible somebody else. Uh, here, resources. Or right, well, yeah, might have to come back around to that one. Um, there's a whole bunch of calls for participation out at the moment. There's a GPU hackathon happening at NERSC. Applications are due at the end of September. Um, coming up in a couple of weeks, there's a, a webinar on focus on ally skills. Um, Supercheck, the checkpointing workshop, which will be held at uh, SC22, now has a lightning talks track. So if you've been sort of doing some work in that area, but it's not quite a, you know, a full talk level, but you, um, you, uh, I think it would be very interesting to sort of yeah, see um, yeah, yeah, quicker snaps of, of what people are doing. And so that, that's accepting submissions. Uh, Confab22 is, ESNet's first annual user meeting, and that's coming up in October 12 and 13. So, uh, let's see, 
uh, insights. So we've got a uh, workshop for uh, insight systems and compute profiling at the end of August. And the next um, ECP ideas webinar on software packaging is coming up early in September. Um, most of those, I think there are details in the weekly email. A few upcoming ones that uh, I don't think are in the weekly email yet, but we'll be making announcements on them uh, soon. We have a new user training being planned for September. Uh, we're planning the NUG annual meeting for October. And uh, we're also planning for a day-to-day uh, -day event and you know, a bit of a, a deep dive into some, uh, some of the, the NISAP case studies and using GPUs for science uh, all in October. So watch this space. Are there any other announcements that um, yeah, around the, the NERSC user community? Clayton. Uh, yeah, so this um, next month in September, we will be doing um, allocation reductions. Um, ah. I can put the, uh, um, the link to the page in the, in the chat. Um, but uh, sometime later today, um, we'll be sending out warning emails, essentially, uh, for for users who currently are not meeting the the usage uh, criteria, uh, they'll get a warning email saying that you either need to step up your production or request an exemption. Um, so uh, we're scheduled to do the reductions on September fifteenth. September fifteenth, say so another month. Yeah. Thanks for that. Any other announcements or upcoming events? If not, we'll go into our topic of the day uh, and Clayton will walk us through the okay for this year. Uh, I'll stop screen sharing and do you want to take over? Okay, thank you. Okay, so my name is Clayton Bagwell. I'm with the uh, Nurse Account and Allocation Support uh, in the Business Operations and Support Group. And as you've heard, um, oops, get on the right screen here. There we go. Um, ERCAP is the Energy Research Computing Allocations Process. Um, many of you who are PIs know that this is how you request. Uh, access to uh, resources at NERSC. Um, the ERCAP application interface is at uh, ERCAP.NERSC.gov and can be accessed by anyone, don't have to be a PI, um, using your NERSC username, password, and MFA one-time password. Uh, ERCAP we, is used to um, renew current projects for the coming year and also to submit requests for new projects. If you have new research grant and you want to start a project for AY 2023, uh, you would submit uh, an ERCAP request now. Uh, the information we're looking for is like your science objectives and your research approach, resource requirements like computing time, archival and CFS uh, community storage uh, space. Uh, the ERCAP requests are reviewed by in, um, <clears throat> the DOE Office of the Science Program Managers, Allocation Managers and they provide the awards of computing time. Um, requests that um, have passed um, and the process and will be awarded, uh, they'll get uh, an award email sent to them uh, in December. Uh, and this year, the, in 2023, the allocation year starts on January 18th. And a few milestones. Um, so it, um, we opened our cap to start accepting 2023 requests uh, this last Monday, the 15th, and the submission uh, due date is October 3rd. Uh, even though we re accept our cap requests year round, the majority of them are submitted during this period um, so that they can be reviewed in bulk by the, the program managers. Um, if you don't get um, your request in by 
October 3rd, there is a chance that um, it won't get reviewed until next year, at which point they there may not be time available or you may have to wait for someone to give up time during an allocation reduction to get uh, get an award. Um, the requests are reviewed by the program managers in the, the field that you um, are submitting your request for. And again, uh, the award announcements will be made this year, the week of uh, December 12th, again, uh, for the project starting uh, January 18th. <clears throat> um, so the currency of um, computing time is node hours, uh, which most of you are aware of. Um, some of the older, <clears throat> uh, I won't say older, the more uh, people have been around at NERSC for a while know, know that we used to use what was called a NERSC hour, um, just a way of trying to calibrate how we charge for time. Uh, now that we have Perlmutter, uh, we're using Perlmutter as our baseline um, and uh, allocations and charging are now in node hours. So there's the CPU node hours, which are the Perlmutter CPU only nodes. So you're charged for one node hour um, for running on one CPU only node for one hour. And similarly, the GPU node hour is you're charged for one node hour for running on a single GPU accelerated node for one hour. This year, the available CPU node hours is about 15.8 million hours. And this is a little chart showing how the time is distributed amongst the various DOE Office of Science programs. Um, and there's a link to a, play, a page that explains it a little more. Um, uh, GPU time this year is about seven and a half million GPU node hours. Um, and uh, if you're uh, running on GPU, you do want to make sure that your uh, code uh, or applications do run in the GPU nodes. Uh, many of you are probably already familiar with that. Um, if you have any questions, need any assistance with submitting an ERCAP request, you can always send an email to allocations at nurse.gov um, or use our help, our help desk and submit a trouble ticket through help.nurse.gov. Particularly if you have any questions um, about your GPU applications or performance, uh, you should submit a trouble ticket um, that collects a little more information that will help us to answer your questions. Uh, we will also be having uh, ERCAP office hours uh, where you can use Zoom to talk to somebody live and hands-on. Um, the office hours this year are scheduled for August 25th, September 15th and 29th, and of course the due date October 3rd. Uh, there will be morning and afternoon sessions, uh, morning from 9 to 12 Pacific time and uh, afternoon from 1 to 4. Um, in this link will take you to information on how to access the Zoom sessions. Uh, you'll need to log in with your NERSC username and password, et cetera. Um, okay, so um, next will be kind of a, a paper dry run of how um, the ERCAP form works. Uh, if you go to log into ERCAP.nurse.gov, it should bring you to this ERCAP um, request homepage. Um, if you get logged into the just into the help desk, you can look for on the left hand uh, navigation bar under ERCAP requests, and there's uh, an option for manage my requests, which will take you to this homepage. Um, it's divided up into four sections. So the top section is for submitting um, or starting new requests. Um, once you started a request, you don't have to finish it in one sitting. You can save a draft and come back and finish it later. Uh, and those will end up in the deck section for draft requests. Uh, once you've submitted your request and submitted it, and yeah, once you've finished your request and submitted it, I got it, uh, it'll end up under the submitted requests down here. And for 
continuing projects, there will be a section for previous requests. Um, that'll be important to you for finding uh, the ERCAP request number uh, that you want to renew. Um, that uh, when you uh, renew from a particular request number, it, help, it will fill in some of the, uh, the fields in the form for you so you don't have to repeat them. Um, so <clears throat> you can start requests uh, one of two ways. You can either use the buttons uh, on the top of the homepage uh, where you can request a brand new project for 2023. Uh, most people will use the green button for re requesting a renewal project for 2023. Um, and we do still accept requests for 2022, but well, only up to about uh, the end of October. Uh, you can also find links for these same types of actions over on the left-hand uh, navigation bar. We'll do the same thing. Once you get into the ERCAP request, um, we do try to give you a lot of help text um, using highlight highlighting information in uh, uh, colored boxes. Um, the ones in pink are will help you. Are, will, will highlight things that are mandatory. So, if this is a renewal request, you want to put in the number from the previous request that you want to renew in this box, uh, and that will, like I said, help pre-fill some of the information in the request from your previous request. Well, we can, sorry, can I ask? Oh. Yeah. Um, a quick question on this particular screen. But probably you explained that. I was curious about the label. There's the red asterisk in, in after in the below the project title. There's a box for the label. And um, I was wondering what this is. The label is a like a shorter version of your title. So uh, something that can be used like a, a header in a report or, or a list um, that kind of like if you have a, a long 50-word uh, project title, mm -hmm. uh, the label is just something like two or three words to help identify your project um, that makes it easier to display. Oh, OK. Got it. Thanks. OK. Uh, sure. Um, so there are mandatory items uh, that will be highlighted with asterisks. Um, red means that you need there's a field that you do need to fill in. And also, um, we have many of our questions divided up under these tabs uh, under the top section here. Uh, if you see an asterisk next to the label in the tab, that means that there's a question that's mandatory under that tab that still needs to be answered. Uh, kind of gives you an easy way to spot something where, oh, I, I have to go someplace to, to answer a question before I submit it. Uh, we also do have some um, pop-up information boxes. Uh, but if you ho hover over the um, the label for, for a field, um, you'll get some extra information about what may be required there. Um, and some of the fields will have these magnifying glasses next to them, which means that they're um, list options uh, that you can select from. Uh, there's a number of ways to search through those lists. Uh, one is to type in like two asterisks. Um, that will give you a, a longer display of the options. Um, this one has, this one shows 21 options, but it, it actually turns out there's 22. Um, so there's other ways to refine your, your search. You can type in a, a keyword and that will shorten the list to um, the items that have that keyword in them. Also, if you actually, if you click on the actual uh, magnifying glass, it'll give you a pop-up um, box that will give you all of the op options on that list uh, to help search through that. Uh, when you do the, the pop-up box, you can refine your search there by also using um, uh, keywords to, to shorten the list to, to refine what you're looking for. Okay, and then I said, as I said before, these, there's um, tabs at the bottom that have other additional information in, required in them. Um, if you have um, a lot of information that you have to 
fill out, you can designate somebody who's an authorized preparer to help you with doing your request. Uh, you can come down to the box and search for the name of an existing NERSC user, uh, and um, they'll uh, be added to your request. And then they'll be able to access their request and help you fill it out. Um, we also ask for senior investigators. Um, the ERCAP request only allows for one person to be designated as the principal investigator, but on um, many research grants, there are multiple co-PIs. Uh, those people can be listed as senior investigators uh, here in this section. Uh, the next tab is for funding. Um, most of or most ERCAP projects are, are, are funded by the DOE Office of Science. Um, you know, when you click on the checkbox next to the Office of Science here, uh, you'll have additional fields sh show up um, asking for more information, such as the uh, program office that's funding your research, um, the name of the program manager that uh, approved your, your grant, um, and then underneath this list, there's a box for the actual grant number information or PAMS or FPW information. Um, as well as the Office of Science, we also have um, other federal agencies that may be funding in, um, uh, your research, um, other DOE offices other than the Office of Science, such as uh, nuclear energy or environmental management, et cetera. Um, other agencies like uh, NSF, NASA, Department of Transportation, et cetera. Um, in this section, you can select multiple um, agencies who have provided financing or funding. And then underneath, again, underneath this list, there's a box for you to put the grant information in um, for that funding. Uh, additional funding types, there's uh, a section for LDRD funding, uh, state or local governments or agencies, uh, foreign governments, universities, uh, nonprofit organizations, and then of course other if they, you know, if your funding um, comes from something other than one of these uh, designated areas. If your funding doesn't come from the DOE Office of Science or US um, agency or LDRD funding, then we do request we do require you to submit um, information on how your project's uh, research is relevant to the particular DOE Office of Science that you're submitting this request to. Um, your um, research needs to be in alignment with the program mission. Uh, and if it's not, uh, you're less likely to receive an award. Uh, next is a security tab. So NERSE supports um, only open research that's intended to be published in uh, scientific journals, et cetera. We don't allow proprietary research um, and particularly the following areas such as classified or controlled military defense information, export or ITAR. Personally, uh, research in, uses personally identifiable information or protected health information. Um, as long as you um, can follow these, um, adhere to these guidelines, you select this box over here. If for some reason there's something that, um, for some reason you, you need some type of an exemption, uh, you select the, the no box on this side and, and put in information about what kind of an exemption you need. Um, those are those uh, exemptions are val evaluated separately, uh, and we may have to contact you for more information about uh, why you need the exemption and if we can support it. Uh, the next section is the project details. So there's two sections in this one. Uh, the first is a project summary. Um, this is a short kind of a um, low level or what is called high level, some scientific American level of uh, information about what your what your research is about and what you intend to 
accomplish. Uh, this, the second section is going to be a more detailed description, which is what the DOE managers are going to focus on for what you're trying to accomplish, what your research goals are, and, and the process, et cetera. Uh, the more detail, um, the better it'll be for, uh, for them to evaluate your request. Um, these two sections do have fairly large uh, character limits, but if you get something more than like 3,000 characters in your explanation, you probably want to submit um, or attach uh, a, a document um, that, that gives the, the, the more in detail information uh, to your request. And uh, a little later on, we'll show you about how to attach um, other documents to your request. Um, if you're uh, uh, renewing your project, which most people will be doing, uh, there's additional sections uh, below that that are required. Um, your accomplishments um, from using NERSC over the past year. Um, and also any publications that you've had published or are scheduled to be published um, from using NERSC resources. Uh, what we're really focusing on, if if nothing else, if you can provide the DOI for your document, um, we can always get the other additional information um, to fill in uh, into our database. Um, any other presentations or, or publications can also go down into the non-refereed materials uh, in the, the lower section. Okay. Uh, the next part is uh, resources. Um, so the top section, uh, we'll be requesting the CPU and GPU node hours. Um, and when you're requesting um, these hours, you need to enter your request in integers. Um, so you can't put in 2 million uh, or whatever, some abbreviation or whatever, because it will get truncated down to an integer. Uh, so if you ask for 2 million and you only get two hours, that's a stark reduction of what you really wanted. Um, also, uh, entering decimals will get your value rounded, either up or down. Um, so um, please enter, enter your numbers um, in the big integers. <clears throat> Um, uh, when you're requesting GPU time, uh, we do ask that you provide us information on the readiness of your um, code to run on GPUs. Uh, there's a page here that you can refer to um, to see how to evaluate the performance of your, um, your, your code and software to run on GPUs. Uh, and uh, the consultants are always available uh, to help you do that evaluation if you need. You just submit a trouble ticket through the help desk. Um, for storage, uh, HPS archival storage and uh, the CFS project storage, um, these amounts are requested in terabytes. Um, and you do need to request at least enough storage to cover what your current usage is. Um, if not, you'll be given a warning information and you'll need to re-enter a higher number. And again, um, you, we, don't, we only accept integers, so anything with a, a decimal or fraction, whatever, will be truncated. Even though we provide your usage and with a decimal, we'll make your entries in whole numbers. Um, then you'll, we're, we'll be requesting a justification for the computing and storage time that you requested. Um, let us know how you determine how many node hours you need for next year and how much storage you need. Um, just give us your back of the envelope uh, calculations for how you figured out how you, much time you need. Uh, we'll also ask for information about any key events or deadlines. Um, 
basically we're looking to see how consistent usage will be throughout the year and this helps us determine you know the highs and lows of when people will be um, using the computers etc um, do you need uh, real-time computing access like if you're um, associated with some live experiment or something and you need um, to hook up your your experiment to to the computers to process the data in real time and also if um, information about whether you're using uh, doing experimental or observational um, uh, processing and finally any special requirements that you need to, uh, need to be considered by doe or nursc to help you support your um, your project Um, we do ask you to provide information on at least the top five codes that you're using. Um, basically, the, the code name, uh, URL to where there's more information about that particular code, and what it's the code is actually designed to do. And also, if, you know, if the code is GPU enabled or not. Uh, Next tab is supporting information. Um, are you getting any additional HPC support from, from anywhere to uh, awarded or expected to support this project? Uh, just let us know um, who else would be helping out um, in conjunction with uh, what you're getting from NERSC. Also, any additional information that doesn't fall in any of the other categories that you think will support your request, please provide that here. And um, if you want to um, uh, attach a, a document to, to provide additional information, uh, that, that document will end up in this section here. And to attach a document, uh, you'll go up to the, the very top of the ERCAP a request form, you'll see a paperclip. You just click on that uh, paperclip, it'll open up a, a box to help you search your um, file system that you can choose uh, the document to upload. And then once it's finished loading to this box, you want to click on the X to exit. Um, if you click on the checkbox and hit this button down here, it will remove the um, the document, so you just have to do it again to reload it. And once you're finished um, filling out your form, and if you want a, a hard copy of what you filled out, uh, there's a button at the top of the form to create a PDF. Uh, the system will create the PDF and automatically attach it to uh, the ERCAP request. And it'll also show up down here under the uh, attachments section. Uh, you can then download the PDF from, from the ERCAP request, and then you can save it or print it, or whatever you want to do with it. Um, finally, there's a usage agreement um, we, to require you to agree to monitor the usage of the time and resources uh, under your project to make sure that, to the best of your ability, uh, that it is being used for um, the research that you were given uh, the, the grant for. Um, we've also been asked to have you um, ver certify that the, the statements, um, all the information that you provided are true and complete and accurate to the best of your ability. And then you just put in your initials and you'll be ready to submit the request. So there'll be a submit for review button at the very top of the form. Um, you'll get a pop-up box that says, are you sure you are ready to submit this? Um, once you've submitted the request, uh, you won't be able to make changes without us going in and um, converting the, the request back to a draft. Um, if there are any mandatory items that have been missed and you haven't filled out, you'll get a, a message that says this particular item is missing. 
And once you've successfully submitted your RCAP request for review, you'll find it on the RCAP homepage under the submitted requests for review. And it'll stay there until it's been reviewed and um, awarded. Okay, are there any questions? Thanks, Clay. Uh, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat. Uh, I can uh, run through them. Uh, the first one actually was from before you started. Uh, so in that there was there was some comments about GPU readiness. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bin asks, may I ask if we need to provide scaling test data on Perlmutter for justifying our allocation? Um, that is a good question. Um, I don't know if you need scaling information. Um, that's not one of the one of the things one of the specific questions we asked for um, that would be up to the doe program managers and um, richard do you think you have any idea of what they would want richard still here uh he may have left actually so so we are getting sort of quite close to the top of the hour and i, I suspect some people are heading out for next meetings yeah um uh trusting that you've got a few more minutes clayton will sort of continue to run through the questions for the, for sure. the people who can hang around yeah sorry i don't have an answer for that question um it's not something that i've i've seen requested before i wonder if that uh so i think we in the early access period for for early access we did sort of uh look for scaling information to as, as sort of a you know, gate before trying things. Uh, I, I suspect that's not as critical anymore. I think that what's more important is whether whether your code can run on GPUs if you decide to use the GPUs. Hmm. Um, and a, a somewhat related one, perhaps. Um, uh, William asks, are there target or recommended links for the summary and project description? Uh, can you say that again? Uh, is, uh, uh, are there target or recommended uh, links for what you write in the summary and project description? Like examples? Um, or like, you know, should they aim for one page or two pages? Um, My interpretation. Less than that, uh, 3,000 characters or less. <laughs> uh, that's what the fields will hold. So if, if you feel that your explanations or, your, I mean, a summary shouldn't be more than a page, right? Um, uh, the the, uh, the um, more detailed descriptions can be longer, but like I said, 3,000 characters, if it's anything longer than that, uh, it's better to just uh, attach a, a, a longer document to the RCAP request. And it all gets combined together and sent to the to DOE. Sounds good. Uh, uh, Destiny asks, what's the purpose for the create PDF button? Uh, it's only if you want uh, a printable copy of the the ERCAP request, um, you, you can't really, other than doing a screenshot, you can't get all the um, requests, all the ERCAP sections and tabs and everything in one place. So the PDF will, will format everything into one document that you can then print out. Sounds good, so it's sort of for own, own reference really. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Daniel asks, I'm a new PI proxy for our group, but can't see the previous requests when I click on renew a previous request. Uh, what, uh, what should Daniel do? <laughs> okay, have your PI send um, a request to um, allocations to have you added as a authorized preparer um, so that you'll be able to do the um, so you'll be able to see the previous request. Thank you. So I think that was all of the chat questions and Kochi has a hand up. 
Oh, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, do you still have time, Brayton? Sure. Yeah, thanks. I have a couple of questions. Um, so uh, I'm preparing uh, allocation application for uh, not the research, but the, uh, the uh, user group, like a special interest group at NAST. I kind of mentioned earlier during the meeting. Uh, so it's a user group among NASC users that exchange information about this particular called WOLF, that's Admosy model. Because we do want to need, we do want to provide documentations like how to compile, how to run, like the best practices to run this model. And then to do that, we'd like to have small allocation of computing hours and storage. And we'd like to have that as soon as we can. So we are preparing applications for the year 2022 this year, but then 2023 is opening up. So I'm wondering if I can submit the applications to both years at the same time, or should I apply for the current year, wait, get approved, and then renew all? Or yeah, you have any, yeah. You wanna, you wanna submit the request for this year first and get it approved. Uh, so that then when you uh, submit for 23, you'll do it as a renewal. Okay. Uh, but you can't do that until the first one's approved. Okay, thanks. And another question is in this form under resource tab, which I'm trying to uh, open. There is a special request at the bottom. And the one example of the special request was the multi-year needs. And I'm just curious what, does this multi-year need needs like uh, means in the context? Well, for some very large projects, they they're already scheduled to to run for multiple years. Like it's a oh, you know, like okay. a five-year plan or something. And um, so, even though the ERCAP request is only geared for one year at a time, mm -hmm. uh, it'll help us to know if you plan to be using nurse for the next five years, um, we can help plan ahead for um, the resources that we need. Ah, okay, got it. Yeah, I think that's all the questions I have. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks everyone, and especially thanks Clayton. Um, I think that, that is all the questions that we've had uh, so far. Um, Oh, just following up on the question about um, file system licenses on Perlmutter, uh, they are the same the same usage as on Cori and the same names as on Cori. We, we do need to update the documentation to make that more obvious. Um, but there's a, a, an extra sort of nicety that Perlmutter has, which is if you are submitting from scratch, um, it will uh, make the assumption that you probably want a scratch file system license. And so it'll add that in. Um, Automatically, so for yeah, you know, for a lot of cases, you'll sort of get the get the licenses for free. Uh, if you're submitting from home though, and you need Scratch, you're, you're going to want to add that in explicitly. Oh, Steve, can I ask a question on that? Yeah. <laughs> when you say submit the job from Scratch or from home, is that the directory where we issue a Scratch command? Oh, uh, that versus where the Script sits. Yeah, script uh, like that, one, that one I'll have to test to see. Okay. Yeah, I was curious about this question for some time. Mm. So yeah, okay. Maybe I can follow up next next at the next meeting. Yeah, because uh, uh so we'll be capable of seeing both, but I'm not actually sure which one it uses. I think there's a, a certain assumption that, that most people are submitting from the from the same directory that the uh batch script is in. Oh, okay. Yeah, I tend to have submission script in somewhere in CFS, but the actual data in is Scratch and the input data or input text file. And sometimes yeah. model executable is under the co uh, common uh, program or software uh, place or Scratch space. So it's kind of split around, but uh, yeah, it's batch command is I tend to issue from uh, CFS most of Right. Yeah. Okay. I think in cases like that, I mean, if in if in doubt, I would go for yeah, explicitly request what it what it needs. Oh, okay. And in cases like that, it sounds like you actually need multiple file systems. So you probably want to okay. kind of explicit them out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in any case. Great. Thanks. 
Cool. So we are past um, uh, past our official finish time. So we'll wind up there. Um, just a, a reminder: we're always looking for topics. Let's share this uh, link very quickly. You can oops. You can nominate a topic at this link. Um, ah, I can't paste that in very easily. Um, it will uh, it will be there in the slides at the end, and we can add it into. I'll, I'll add it in the webinars channel as well. Uh, lots of people have asked about the recording and slides for this, so we'll get those up as soon as we can, and post a, a note in the webinars channel on Nug Slack. So uh, you yeah, know, watch watch that space. Thank you all for joining us, and particularly for uh, staying a bit longer to uh, yeah, see through to the the end and all the Q and A. And thanks, Clayton, again for walking us through that. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you.